Welcome back to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm sitting here with Nancy Fish, psychotherapist. She has a private practice in Fairlawn, New Jersey, and is a member of the National Association for Social Workers and the National Vulvodynia Association. She treats men and women in her practice who suffer from chronic pelvic pain and is the co-author with Dr. Deborah Cody of the book, Healing Painful Sex, A Woman's Guide to Confronting, Diagnosing, and Treating Sexual Pain. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So, please tell me a little bit more about your practice and approach. So I've been a, a therapist for uh, more than 20 years, but uh, 14 years ago, I became a, a pelvic pain patient myself and decided to uh, focus on that, and that became one of my, my specialty. I treat all different kinds of people, uh, from adolescents all the way up till 99 or 100. Um, I treat anxiety, depression, but I, uh, one of the focus of my practice is dealing with uh, pelvic pain, and I use a, an eclectic approach. I uh, use the majority of my approach is cognitive behavioral therapy because I think that produces the best results. But I also have a, I use psychodynamic approach and dialectical behavioral therapy DBT. So can you um, explain a little bit more about what DBT is because I haven't heard that one before. So DBT was originally created in 1993 to deal with people with a, a personality disorder called borderline personality disorder. Um, but now it's become much more mainstream and it's a very effective tool for dealing with um, emotional regulation, people who have mood dysregulation, anxiety and depression. So um, I have incorporated that into my practice and find that it's very helpful. Awesome, thank you for explaining that. So you can tell us a little bit more about what your experience is like working with patients who are experiencing chronic pelvic pain? Well, most of the time that um, when people come to see me, the first thing they say is I've never met anybody else with pelvic pain, and that's the most striking. So their sense of isolation and the aloneness is, is the most striking. So when they're able to talk about their feelings and, and I am able to normalize their feelings, that seems to be one of the biggest gifts I can give to clients. Wow, that is so important, and that's something that we're really trying to do with this summit is let people know that they're not alone and there is community. So tell us a few myths that patients can often come in with or a mindset that they have that you can enlighten us to why it's not true? Well, by the time people get to me or by the, or by the time they get to any other health, practi health practitioner, they've probably seen like seven or eight um, um, doctors and have been told all kinds of things, um, very invalidating things. So I would say that a lot of people, by the time they get to me, have PTSD just from the medical system itself. So people are told that oh, I don't see anything wrong with you, or it's all in your head, or it's psychological, or some people who, who can't have uh, intercourse um, you know, are told, well, just find a different way to have sex, or put your feet up and have a glass of wine. So people are meant to, are being told that this is in their head and this is not real, and um, that's very damaging. So by the, you know, by the time they, they come to a good mental health practitioner or a medical practitioner, when somebody tells them their problem is real, it's a physical problem, it's such a relief. And then when they name the problem and then take the mystery out of it, it becomes so much less scary. That's so great. And I think that there is also a misnomer where people are like, I'm going to a psychotherapist, it must be in my head. But really what you're doing is you're saying, no, you have real pain and I'm going to help you through it. So I think that's super powerful. Can you tell us some examples of issues and challenges that your patients face around sexual health who also experience pelvic pain? Well, one other thing that people feel is they, they're also, their libido can go down because when you have pain in an area of your body that's supposed to give you pleasure, then you become afraid of sex. And sometimes people don't even want their partners to touch them, just to kiss them because they're afraid it's going to lead to intercourse. And the other area that I work with with, with my clients is educating them about what sex is. I think the media has done a real number on people's heads. Of, you know, for example, that show Mad Men, which I, I, I really enjoy, but every five seconds people are ripping the, each other's clothes off. So that's the idea that people have of sex, that you have to have this mad, passionate kind of sex, and, and, and then they feel very, it makes them feel very inadequate. I also look, talk about sex as a smorgasbord. It's not just intercourse. Intercourse is just one element of sex. There's so many different things that people can do sexually if they can't have intercourse while they're recovering from their pelvic pain. 
Awesome. Would you mind going a little bit further into detail of some things couples can try if intercourse is not an option right now? Okay. Well, there are so many different things. Uh, people can do oral sex. People who just touch each other. It's, it's a great way to just explore parts of your body that you never thought were erogenous. So just like, just be open to the idea of talking about, you know, what, telling your partner what part of your body might, you might want to have touched, and then you'll find out that you, you can be aroused in an area that you thought you never could before. Being communicating with your partner is really important. Um, people think that when you and start having sex that you never have to talk about it. Well, you have, this has to be a dialogue throughout the rest of your life. Um, because at different points of your life, your sexual needs or desires change. And every time you have sex, it can be totally different. Um, so I, I try to do what I call sensate-focused um, sexuality, meaning that people should talk about work on pleasuring each other and working on intimacy rather than always just looking for to getting climax. And you know, it's a big it's a big hurdle, especially for a lot of guys, because you know they feel that if they Intercourse is, you know, the be all and the end all, and it's. I know for a lot of women, it's not. I'm, I'm not saying that people should not want want to have sexual intercourse, but that's not the whole the whole deal. Yeah, there's a lot more. And can you give some advice to those of us watching who are dating and um, maybe are looking for a partner but aren't in a committed relationship right now? That, that's a great question because a lot of my clients will say, "I can't date when I have pelvic pain," and. Thank God I have the experience of working with so many people. I've worked with, you know, more than, I'd say close to a thousand people since I've started practicing with pelvic pain. And so many of the men and women have been able to successfully date while they have pelvic pain. Um, because everybody comes to a relationship with some baggage. Uh, and I ask people to reframe the way they look about themselves sexually. So when you talk about yourself as a sexual or sensual being, it's not just your genitals that we're talking about. That everything, every part of your persona goes into your being sexual. Um, your, you know, your personality, your intelligence, your, your, your charm, your sense of humor, your, your quirks. Those are all the things. So when, I, when people are dating, I ask them to think about that. And then often, if they, not all, no, always, if they meet somebody that's worth their time, that person is going to understand. I've seen so many people enter into success, successful and happy relationships, even, even when they can't have intercourse. Awesome, thank you for sharing that with us. And um, within the work that you're doing um, in your practice, can you tell us a little bit about what your patient journey is like when they come to you and what the work looks like um, in terms of like their initial consultation, um, the regularity of sessions, what are some of the things you work on, um, especially with the patients who are suffering from pelvic pain? That's uh, an, another great question. Uh, with every, I look at every patient or client as an individual. So my basic approach is, you know, when I, when I meet somebody first, first of all, I have a 15 minute free consultation. And then I meet people either in my office or I do a lot of Skype work. I work with people over the country or internationally. So if people can't um, meet me in person, the therapy is just as effective working through Skype. Uh, and everybody's needs are different. Some people just need to see me for a few times, three or four times, or sometimes just once. Sometimes people are seeing another therapist and use, just use me as a co consultant to, you know, to deal with the, the sexual or the pelvic pain part. Um, so it really varies depending on the person. Um, if somebody has a very traumatic background, my, uh, my treatment might be more psychodynamic. I always include a cognitive behavioral piece, but uh, when somebody, I'll, and when I say traumatic background, I don't mean sexual trauma, I mean all different kinds of trauma. Um, trauma could be growing up in an invalidating household where your feelings were never validated or you were never made to feel safe. So, it, so the, the, the treatment varies depending on the person, but I always tell a person when they come to see me is that they're interviewing me because in order for this, the relationship to work, there has to be a chemistry. So when they come to see me, they have to feel comfortable with me. Um, if they don't feel comfortable with me, then, then it's not gonna work. Um, thankfully, most of the time, it does work out that way, uh, but I want them to know that they're, they're a partner with me. I can't do the work alone. They have to work in partnership. But it's, you know, and I ask people to always speak up and tell me, and, and they should, with, when any therapeutic relationship, um, they should tell their therapist that um, if something is not working, let them know, because um, we all are, you know, we all have 
I always say I'm talking, I sometimes I, I will be brainstorming out loud when I talk to somebody. I'm thinking this, what do you think about this? And sometimes it feels good to them and sometimes it doesn't. But just everybody should advocate for themselves no matter what kind of um, relationship they're in, whether, you know, any, whether a mental health practitioner or with a doctor or in any relationship. Definitely, and I think that's one of the things that is kind of in a through line through this uh, summit is that self-advocacy is so important and um, definitely it's easier when you have a practitioner who is open-minded and caring, um, such as yourself and some of the other um, practitioners that we've interviewed. So can you tell us some mental health self self-care tips that um, our viewers can try at home? Sure, um, there are so many different things you could do. Uh, the one, one thing that I would like people to know is no matter what pain level they're in, everybody can improve. And, um, and what pain does, it's very disempowering. So everything that I ask people to do is to gain that sense of empowerment. Um, and anything you do, anything that you do in life should look at as an empowering tool. I ask people to be very gentle with themselves. Um, and not to engage in what I call all or nothing or black and white thinking. For example, people who have pain often become very socially isolated because they feel they can't, that they can't go out to dinner with their friends for, or go out to a social occasion, um, then they just won't go out at all. So I say it's just to modify your activities. You don't have to recluse yourself. Sometimes you don't feel like going, doing anything, that's fine also. Sometimes you need to recharge your battery. I, I sometimes say to people, like, spend a day watching Netflix if you have to. If the, you know, because you can't deal with the public, and that's also that's not if it, if that goes on for days, then that's um, a problem. But um, it's just it's it's really like just a way of recharging yourself. Um, and the other thing is to get do things that get you outside of yourself. Uh, when you focus on the pain all the time, the pain actually feels worse. So if you are engaging in something like just talking to a friend or doing some game on your, on your computer, or doing one of those adult, adult coloring books, um, or even trying to go out and reach and help somebody else. It's such a very empowering tool, and it really does physically help the way you, you physically feel, and your pain does feel less. Now, I'm not talking about agonizing pain. When you're in agonizing pain, you know, that does not, doesn't help. But um, if you have sort of this kind of background manageable pain, it can be very helpful. Um, you know, understanding that this, this, this is a hard process and, and to give yourself a break and not to, and not to be too hard on yourself because I find that people will say, you know, well, because it's, it's an invisible kind of a pain. People don't understand the pain that, you know, that, that how difficult it is. So sometimes I'll say that, you know, dealing with public pain is like climbing Mount Everest without your tools. Um, so sometimes you just need to some, say, say, pull back and say, okay, I, you know, I need to be more gentle with myself. Um, and asking and finding ways to get validation from other people to tell people. I find that people in relationships, a, a partner often wants to, especially m male partners, and I'm sorry if I sound I'm sounding sexist, and this is all with the intention of, of um, with a good intention, want to fix the problem. But sometimes just being heard and, and, say, and having somebody tell you, I can't imagine what you're going through. This must be so hard. It's so validating. Um, so just trying to find relationships where you can get validation. Um, mindfulness and meditation and breathing are so essential. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard this from other people. But breathing is a form of medicine. And it's great because it has absolutely no side effects. So you need to talk to somebody. It's not complicated, but you need to talk to somebody about how to breathe in a therapeutic way. And that really helps re-regulate your dysregulated central nervous system. I've heard, I think you've probably heard of that Definitely. also. Dr. Allison Shirkande actually um, did a diaphragmatic breathing tutorial with me. So um, if you want to go back and refer to that, it's also in the group. Um, so that's definitely something we've discussed. Yeah, and, um, and being in, in the moment and not looking at anything. I, one, one, one thing is a pet peeve of mine. I don't like the word baby steps. Everybody says to me, well, I'm going to take baby steps. There are no baby steps. Every step is significant that you take. So never minimize anything that you're doing. So for example, people, often people, when they first start on this pelvic pain journey, can't wear the clothes that they want. They can't wear jeans. Or guys can't buckle their pants the way they like to. So when they get to the point where they can wear a different kind of clothes, that's very something to celebrate. That's not a baby step. 
um, or for somebody who's not able to sit for more than 10 minutes and they can sit for 20 minutes. That's a big deal. So it never minimize any progress you made. Uh, one, one thing is also not to repress your feelings. Now, I'm not saying you have to go around to the world and talk about your pain all the time, but if you repress your feelings and, and don't vent, then the pain can also feel worse and um, your muscles can get tighten up. So that's one thing that's very important. And, and then monitor your reactivity. So when one thing that we all, most of us do, including me, is we react to things very strongly. So this is a, a DBT term, is taking a pause and just saying, I'm going to pause before I react, and using your wise mind, and not, um, not just relying purely on your emotions or your, your, your intellect, but using both your emotions and intellect to react to things. That's, it's, it's, this is, these are practices that you have to pra practice every day. They don't come naturally. But what, the good thing that you can do is when, when you practice this, it, it becomes much more natural. And the, the thing about cognitive behavioral therapy is I'm, I ask people to reframe the way they look at things. For example, if somebody looks at themselves as a pain patient or what I call developing an, ident an illness identity, then they're going to feel terrible. So you are not your pain. You do have, you do have pain, but this is just something that's part of you that you're working on to constantly improve. Uh, so it's the way you look at your, your condition can affect how it feels. Mm -hmm. Thank you, those were all so incredibly helpful. Thank you for sharing. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit more about your book? Uh, so when I wrote this book, I was, I was a patient of, of Dr. Cody's when I started having pelvic pain. And, and she was just such, she is such a, she's not practicing, but she's a, the most, just an amazing doctor. And we just, you know, through email, we talked about our different feelings about, you know, pain and how people are, invalidated. In fact, the first thing that we, were, we wanted to name our book is, is it's not in your head because so many people are told that it's in their head. Um, so it was about a five-year journey to write this book. And I wrote the book when I was really, really, really sick. So I was not doing well. Um, and I think it was, I don't know if there was some divine intervention or just it was a passion. So it really became so important for me to help other people knowing that the journey that I had gone through and I wanted other people to make this journey easier for others. So we had interviewed about 20 different pa patients for the book and half of it is uh, medical, um, and half of it is psychological and then, and, and half of it, well, I'd say a lot of it is also, you know, the intertwining of both. But it's really, it's a, it's a tool, it's a, it's a tool that's a, a, it's an educational tool and a, an empowerment tool to and let, to be, let people know that all the feelings that they're having, what I like to people, let people know is that every feeling they have is normal. It's a normal reaction to an abnormal situation because mm -hmm. people come to me and they feel like they're crazy. And I tell them, you're not crazy. Uh, people will talk to me about, um, and that's in the book and that we talk a lot about is have suicidal ideation. Now when I see somebody who's really suicidal, that of course is a concern. But almost all my clients at some point have thought, okay, well maybe it would be better if I didn't wake up in the morning or if I got hit by a truck because the pain can be so debilitating and, and uh, disempowering and scary. So I, I tell people that's often a, a coping mechanism. It's sort of a way to say that I have control over, over the, my pain, that if it gets to be too much, I can stop it. Now, I'm not validating that people, or not, I'm not endorsing people to, have, to think suicidally, but just to understand that that's a norm. They're not crazy. Um, it's not an abnormal reaction. Of course, it's not something you should ever cure, keep to yourself. So these are some of the things that we talk about in the book. So we help people understand that you're not alone and that anything they're feeling is, I mean, is not, it's, it's it, you know, so many other people all over the world feel the same thing. Definitely, and that's such a powerful message um, that we're not alone and that's what the summit is about, is coming together in community. I'd love to hear some patient success stories that you can share with us. Well, one stands out, um, this is a woman that came to me probably about 10 years ago and she was suffering from terrible pelvic pain. She's a you know, really bright, talented, energetic woman with two young children working full time. And she was engaging in suicidal thinking, suicidal ideation, she was so desperate. 
And what she had told me was one thing that had gotten her through was I said, you, there is definitely hope for you to get better. You will improve, you will get better. And through working with me and using a cognitive behavioral approach and the mindfulness and uh, breathing techniques and seeing a good medical practitioner, she was able to really overcome her pelvic pain. She has flare-ups, but now I would say she would not she would say that pelvic pain is not really part of her daily life. So she's just one of many success stories, not just that, that I have, that so many other doctors have. Thank you. Please tell us how we can reach you. Uh, people generally reach me by email, so I can be reached at my email address, which is nancyfishbrofman at gmail.com, or through my website, which is nancyfishlcsw.com. Those are the best ways to reach me. Awesome. I'm going to link all of that in the group, and thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, one, just one last message that I want to give. This is a team approach. Uh, you, you need to use an inter integrative approach to, um, to, to deal with, with pelvic pain. So I think it's so wonderful that you've gotten all these practitioners together, because this is, you know, people can avail themselves of, of these services and can get onto a, a journey of healing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Now I'd like to hear from you. Please share with us one takeaway from the interview in the comments below. Give us a like and share this group with someone who you think will benefit. Thank you.